sorry, a little bit slow on the draw there. In this uh, screencast, I'm going to talk to you about positive and negative feedback loops, which are pretty cool concepts and uh, how we can use them to understand global climate change. So a feedback loop is basically if there's a process in which um, the outcome of the uh, process changes the inputs of the process, then it tends to influence itself in an ongoing way. And we call that a feedback loop. So look at this one I've got here. So, so, so let's just say <clears throat> the, as the atmosphere gets war warmer, it causes a drought in a rainforest area. Well, the drought reduces the productivity of the rainforest, so they're not engaging as much photosynthesis. Well, that lack of productivity now means that they're pulling less carbon dioxide out of the air and therefore leaving more of it in the air. Well, the increased amount of CO2 in the air is going to trap more infrared light, making the air warmer. And as the air gets warmer, it causes the drought to get worse, which causes even less productivity, which causes even more CO2, which causes even more IR to get dry. So we call this a positive feedback loop. And so there's a number of these feedback loops that come into play in global warming. Let's just take a look at them. So a positive feedback loop is one in which <clears throat> the output affects the system in such a way that it increases the trend going forward. Okay, so let's look at this exa example here, uh, when berries ripen. So basically, when a berry begins to ripen, it gives off a kind of gas, a uh, carbon compound called ethylene. Now, the thing is, you might have learned, seen this at home, like if you want to get fruit to ripen, you put them in a paper bag with other fruit that are already ripe. So as one ripens, it triggers the other one to ripen. So what happens is, when the berries give off this ethylene gas, it causes other berries to ripen. Well, as they ripen, they give off ethylene. And so now there's even more ethylene. So now even more berries become ripe, give off even more ethylene, causing even more berries to ripen. Before you know it, in just a couple of days, all the berries are ripe. And it happened because of a positive feedback loop. Now, a negative feedback loop does the opposite. Negative feedback loop, the outcome of the uh, of the the loop is such that it reduces the change. It, it, it suppresses the change rather than accelerating as it did in a positive feedback loop. So, <clears throat> so let's just look at this, okay? So carrying capacity is a classic example, right? So what, what are inputs? Our inputs are food resources are going into the system and our output is the growth of the population. So what happens is uh, as there's more food available, the population will increase. Well, as the population increases, there'll become less food available. And as there's less food available, that means there'll be less population growth. And so it has a tendency to, to limit itself. So these negative feedback loops are kind of like putting on the brakes and positive feedback loops are like putting on the gas. Uh, so a negative feedback loop is self-regulating so that more of one causes eventually to have less of that same thing. Now let's talk about global warming. What are the main factors that uh, uh, influence global warming? Well, there's really two things, right? There's, there's greenhouse gas concentrations, mostly carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and then there is albedo, reflectivity. And so basically more albedo means there's less light being absorbed, less temperatures, and less albedo, less snow, means there's more energy being absorbed. So <clears throat> basically what we find then is positive feedback loops are going to increase the rate of climate change, and negative feedback loops are going to put the brakes on it. They're going to slow it down. So really just think of positive as the gas and, and negative as the brakes. Okay, so um, let's look at one example here, okay? Snow melt. So here's what happens. So as temperature goes up due to global warming, it causes the snow and sea ice to melt, and that reduces albedo. Well, if you reduce albedo, then that means is there's going to be more absorption because less, is, less energy is being reflected in space, and that means the temperature is going to go up. Well, if the temperature goes up, that's going to make more snow melt, and if more snow melts, then there's even less albedo, so there's more absorption, so the temperature goes up even more, which makes even more snow melt, and you, you get the point, okay? So there's this positive feedback loop. It feeds on itself, causing the condition to become more and more and more pronounced. There's another one, uh, and this has to do with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide uh, dissolves into the ocean, and it also dissolves out of the ocean or gets degassed from the ocean. So we call this the ocean's carbon pump. And basically, if you recall, uh, cold water is better able to dissolve gases, be it O2 or CO2 or anything, and warm water is less able to dissolve them. So what we find is, uh, here's our positive feedback loop. As air temperature increases, it causes the water to warm. Well, when you warm the water, it takes in less carbon dioxide and gives off some of the carbon dioxide it already has. So what happens is the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere goes up because it got warmer. Well, when the carbon dioxide level goes up, we trap more heat, making the atmosphere hotter, which makes the ocean hotter, 
which makes you give off more carbon dioxide and take less out of the atmosphere, which puts even more you know, CO2 in the atmosphere, which traps even more heat, positive feedback loop we're putting on the, the, the gas. <laughs> Let's talk about a negative feedback loop, uh, cloud formation due to the evaporation of seawater. So what happens is, as air temperature goes up, we'll get more evaporation from the oceans. Well, more evaporation is going to cause uh, water vapor to form. Water vapor is now going to make clouds, which reflect sunlight. Reflected sunlight reduces the temperature of the ocean, which makes evaporation happen less. So it basically put the brakes on the situation. Temperature went up, evaporation went up. When evaporation went up, cloud cover went up. Cloud cover reduced the amount of energy coming into the system, and that caused the temperature to come back down. So, and again, this is almost like a, like a carry capacity curve. But unfortunately, a lot of them are positive feedback loops. So another classic one and an important one is the melting of Arctic permafrost. So, so in, in the Arctic areas, not the Antarctic, because there's really, it's almost, there's hardly any life there at all, at least on terrestrial life. But in the Arctic, we have this tundra area. And this tundra area has a short growing season. It's one of our, our biomes. Uh, and it's, it, it's often low lying and wet. And so this tends to make a, a boggy situation, which anaerobes predominate. So the main... Uh, uh, decomposers tend to be anaerobes. Anaerobes produce uh, methane gas. And so what happens is permafrost is this layer of frozen water that has, well, a lot of stuff frozen in it, including methane gas from previous uh, anaerobic decompositions from, you know, long ago when it was a warmer environment. So what you find is this. As the air temperature goes up, the permafrost is going to melt. We see pictures here. This is what it looks like now as the permafrost melts in Siberia. As the permafrost melts, it releases uh, methane, CH4. Well, as you put more methane in the atmosphere, you end up trapping more heat. So you make the Arctic hotter. If the Arctic gets hotter, you melt more permafrost. When you melt more permafrost, you release more methane. When you release more methane, you trap more infrared. So you melt more permafrost. You have this positive feedback loop happening. And, and these positive feedback loops, these two in, in particular, the snow melt and the permafrost melting, these are the big ones that explain why it is that we find that the Arctic regions, the ones in the north, tend to be uh, experiencing global warming at a much, much greater rate than the rest of the world. Just take a look at this. Remember, Arctic, not Antarctic, because the Antarctic doesn't have uh, as much sea ice. It has land ice that's still very thick, even though it's melting. Uh, it's there's still it's not all the way gone, so we're, we're, the albedo isn't changing yet. All right. Uh, but in the Arctic region, that's not true. We have sea ice, which is very thin. So sea, when sea ice melts, we just have exposed seawater, which definitely absorbs uh, sunlight. So we find this in the Arctic region, where we have uh, sea ice rather than very thick continental ice. And we have the uh, uh, tundra, which uh, has the permafrost, which releases methane. What we tend to find is these two things combine to make temperature changes much more extreme in the far north and latitude. So if you look at this graph here, it really illustrates it. So this is, if we go from the equator south, we don't really see a whole lot of change in the overall temperature of the planet with latitude uh, in terms of, of the um, change in temperature. But as we go north, we see a pronounced increase in the change in temperature as we head towards the pole. Because when we get in that polar region, which we see here showing up in red here, which means the temperature changes are between two and four degrees, um, that is almost exclusively confined to those polar regions. Uh, and that's something they're definitely going to ask you about on the APES test. Okay, and now what happens as a consequence of this is that it puts certain species at risk. And there's not a lot of terrestrial species living in the Arctic, but there are some there. And they're ones that are actually very near and dear to the hearts of people, especially polar bears. And so what we're finding is that this um, rapidly changing uh, landscape in the north is threatening the extinction of several species, including polar bears, which are only found in the Arctic regions, uh, also the Arctic fox. And while walruses, uh, being oceanic creatures, exist in both the northern and southern hemisphere, uh, well, depending on the species, so they're probably going to be okay. But what we find is polar bears are probably not going to be okay because they they spend their they hibernate in the winter, they wake up in the in the spring, and they hunt in the summer on sea ice, getting seals and whales. Well, guess what? As the sea ice melts away, they lose territory to hunt from, and so uh, they're, they're less successful, and they end up starving to death. Same thing is true for the Arctic fox, although the Arctic fox is not exclusively constrained to, to hunting on 
Um, so I said neither is the polar bear. Polar bears hate behavior are changing. They're starting to come into like Inuit villages and raid their garbage cans. Uh, and walruses use the sea ice to rest on and also to, to hunt for fish, but mostly to rest on. All right, so there you go. Uh, that's positive and negative feedback loops. I hope it made sense to you. If not, make sure you check on me so you, you do gain a full understanding of it. All right, see you guys later.